is Anish Chopra, and I have the pleasure of establishing the foundation for what will be a very exciting panel. Uh, let me first introduce the folks who are coming up on stage so that you all know who's with us today. Uh, Judith Murray, raise your hand. Judith Murray is the campus executive officer at Altus Education and Ivy Bridge, uh, Ivy Bridge College. Uh, Dean Flores, there you are, raise your hand, thank you so much. Chief Executive Officer of 20 Million Minds Foundation. I presume that'll be you, Richard Young, right there in the middle, Richard Young. Yeah. Senior Education Architect at Microsoft. And rounding us out, is that you, Tammy? Tammy Wincup, the Chief Operating Officer at Everfi. Thank you so very much for being here. I have the uh, pleasure of helping us walk through a couple of ideas, some very provocative comments, by the way, from what you did this morning, thank you. Uh, but before we get started on the panel, I thought I might just take the liberty of a few moments up front uh, maybe to set the stage on the perspective that, that I carry to this conversation, and that might be the basis on which we would have a nice discussion. I served as uh, Governor Kane's Secretary of Technology from uh, 2006 to 2009, and then served as President Obama's Chief Technology Officer up until last year. And I want to take you to Danville, Virginia, as a starting point. There was a plant, uh, Corning owned and operated the plant, that used to, among other things, make uh, cathode ray tubes. The uh, plant announced in, uh, in that time period when I was in the governor's office that they would shutter their operations and they would lose the final 200 employees that were working out in Danville. And it was metaphorically the challenge of modernizing and new technology and new product. How many of you own a cathode ray tube television anymore? Any of you buy any of them? Probably not. Yet that very same time period, we received a review the governor commissioned of scientists and engineers who took a look at the Virginia physics uh, textbooks because we wanted to get a sense for whether or not we were up to standard. Are we presenting the right information to kids so that they can compete in the 21st century economy? And what does it say in the Virginia physics textbook? It says that the main component of a television is the cathode ray tube. So you have students in Danville proudly coming home to say to their parents that you are at the center of the television revolution at a time when their mom and dad are out of work. Clearly, we needed to change the content and to upgrade or modernize what we were teaching folks so they would be up to speed. But the textbook adoption cycle was like molasses. I think it would have been 2011, maybe 2012, when we would have gone through the formal reviews, the uh, evaluation, the production of new textbooks, the acquisition cycles, and that meant several years where students in Virginia would lack access to the information so that they could proceed in their career path with hopefully information to prepare them for the future. I came to Open Education Resources not as a technology chest, uh, chest thumping champion, but out of necessity to bring new ideas and new content to market. That very summer, when we learned of this gap between what kids were told in class, what the textbooks shared, and what was reality, we decided to crowdsource the solution. I asked Governor Kane if he'd be kind enough to put out a no dollar solicitation since we have no money, and he did. We thought of this challenge in the summer. President, the governor puts the, the rollout in, um, in, uh, in September and says, we have no money, but if you have interest in helping us to upgrade our physics information, please volunteer. We'll thank you, we won't pay you. But dozens of people around the country, university professors, students, even a high school, a couple high school students said, we wanna be a part of this movement. And in collaboration with the CK12 Foundation, Virginia launched in less than six months from the time the governor's announcement to the selection of the folks who would help us through the four rounds of peer review to make sure it met quality the Virginia Physics Flexbook, all of which is freely available online for remix and reuse. And we did so out of necessity because we wanted to make sure that the kids in Virginia had access to the information that mattered on modeling and simulation, on biomedical imaging, and so forth. This wasn't a fight between intellectual property rights and you know, the commercialization and the open source movement. This wasn't about price. This is about 
accuracy, and ensuring our folks could compete. Because of this effort, Virginia went on to pass three pieces of legislation to standardize and treat fairly open education content so that the monies we allocate to schools for acquisition of materials could include open education resources in addition to licensed material and could essentially, I, I call it, uh, you know, chunking up the content so you could buy a collection of learning objects as opposed to the full enchilada. I share this with you because we're going to into this conversation now, I think asking three questions and we're gonna be posing a number of these to the panelists today. But from my vantage point, we're at a time where we're looking at a tremendous amount of change in the economy. While we still have a high unemployment rate, we have millions of jobs that are open and unfilled. So question number one, what are we teaching? Is the content or the materials we're teaching preparing our workers for the jobs that are available? Second question, how are we teaching it? We have the traditional classroom model, but in, I love the trough of disillusionment is, is upcoming on the MOOCs, but whatever the model may be, new models are emerging that are coming up, may be successful, may fail, may need, modern, may need uh, tweaking, but how are we teaching? And then obviously in any innovation, it's not just about the trial or the prototype, it's about scale. And how are we gonna scale what works? These are the questions that have occupied my time in the public sector, a quick litany of opportunity. We've now started to see action in what we teach. The Department of Labor and the Department of Education are investing $2 billion over the last several years and continuing to put uh, new curriculum, new content that are aligning the needs of workers and the, and the, and the jobs that are available today through uh, a community college, the TAA grants. With uh, how we teach, uh, Secretary Duncan and I launched something called the Open Education Data Initiative to open up assessment data and to build essentially tools that would allow new models of learning to plug and play, whether it be badges or other movements, so that we can start to engage in new forms of teaching to demonstrate knowledge. And last but certainly not least, to scale what works, we've begun through the learning registry, establishing a technical foundation so that we have, why well, I like to call it the teacher internet, so that what works is quickly and easily discoverable and shareable across the entire uh, teaching community at little to no marginal cost. Today's conversation will focus on this next wave of digital education. I look to be a little bit provocative, but to surface three big categories. One, a sense of what's happening. What is the changing landscape we're operating in? We're gonna ask our panelists to give us a lay of the land. Second, I wanna understand barriers. What is it that's limiting us or inhibiting or stalling any progress if in fact there is a sense that we haven't yet fully leveraged the tools? And last but certainly not least, the flip of this, where and how might we scale what works? And what's the right role for policy, what's the right role for technology and innovation, acquisition, and so forth. You've heard enough of me and from me. What I'd now like to do is turn to my panelists and begin that very starting conversation. What's different? Why don't you start, Judith, and give us a landscape. Where are we and what's changed in the digital education world as you see it? Um, I think there's been tremendous change over the last number of years. If you think back to more than a decade ago when uh, MIT rolled out, um, the first open educational resources, which was really about pushing content out into the, uh, into the world um, for others to see and to use, to um, you know, the, the movement that's happened in the last few years, which is all about reuse of those, those resources, both by other institutions um, and by students in general, or learners that are out there in the community who want to access those. I think some of the most exciting changes that have happened um, with respect to open educational resources in the last couple of years is the uh, movement to open textbooks. Um, UNESCO actually more than a decade ago coined the term open educational resources and last year I was fortunate enough to be at the um, UNESCO meeting in Paris where there was a new declaration signed um, by countries uh, committing to the fact that any resources um, uh, that are created using public funds will be made available for free um, to the public. And so that was a, a great move forward in the open educational movement. The second uh, most exciting change in open educational resources, and I think the biggest change that, um, or the change that can have the most dramatic effect on what we're doing in higher education, was talked about with the panel yesterday around the ability to actually give academic credit 
and to get credentials that are uh, formed from open educational resources or learning that has happened through open educational resources. That's really the holy grail that needs to be cracked. And when we crack that, then we can really make changes. Thank uh, you for that. I agree with everything she uh, just pointed out. And we're also seeing a lot of innovation taking place where online courses from major universities, whether private or public, are being made available not only to other college students, but also to K-12 and even their parents. We're seeing a lot of uh, parents actually re-enter the education field uh, simply by working with their kids. And their kids are introducing them to YouTube and other social media systems where they can actually tap directly into classes that are being taught online. Um, I'll use a, an example in my own situation with my mother. My mother is 70 years old and she is now becoming very interested in computer science. She never understood what I did before. Um, when I first got into this field, she used to tell people that um, when I explained to her that I was a systems analyst, she thought that I worked for an actuarial company. <laughs> and so when she finally started to understand what I actually did, and now being able to take these courses online, it really speaks to the power of the internet. Getting back to uh, our opening speaker's comments, that the internet didn't really change anything, it just became another vehicle for content. What we are starting to see right now is that people that we never could reach before from an educational uh, perspective are now starting to leverage that. But what is still king is content, but content in the sense of can the individual user tailor it to fit their particular learning styles? And I think that is going to be the next wave of innovation. How do we actually tap into the individual so that they can now really gauge how they're learning something and modify it in such a way that they can get greater value out of it? Well, since we're uh, going uh, down the row, I, l let me say, I, I think what has really changed in this dialogue is not innovation. I think uh, the opening speaker has pointed out from the television all the way through the internet, we've had these spurts of innovation. I think what's changed in this space is the way we talk about it. And quite frankly, uh, I think success in this space and the movement in this space has come because of mainstream press. I mean, we're no longer talking to each other in an echo chamber. Uh, we Twitter each other all day long. Uh, we used to do this uh, many, you know, two or three years ago. Uh, I think now you see David Brooks, uh, you see the New York Times, you see mainstream editorial boards talking about the credit. You see mainstream editorial boards talking about online education. You see, if you will, a discussion in our higher education institutions that used to be, quite frankly, uh, insider discussions. Now, uh, as been mentioned by uh, Dr. Green, you know, the pounding on the, on the door of the president by the trustee who happened to pick up the Los Angeles Times or the New York Times or the Washington Post and read about uh, the MOOC uh, madness that's occurring, uh, if you will, in, in this nation and asking the question, why aren't we doing this? I think what's changed and has brought uh, an inertia to this particular debate is this mainstream discussion. I think if we continue to have had it if you will, among ourselves at conferences, on Twitter, uh, in our echo chambers, I think that would have remained, if you will, uh, closed. I think today it's a very much an open discussion where you see governors uh, pointing in all sorts of directions, whether it's Florida, whether it's California, whether it's Texas. Everyone is trying to figure out how to fix a gap of growing cost and student dissatisfaction. And I think we are now at this point in time, I think I missed uh, Mike Saylor's uh, comment yesterday, but, I, but I, I did read it on Twitter in our, in our little echo chamber where he said one or two of us could actually change the world. And I think what he was really saying is that if we get the word out in the mainstream to folks who are the policy makers, have the ability to do that, uh, then I think we'll see lasting large change. And, and I think what's really changed is this discussion and a much larger discussion. Timmy? Well, first of all, uh, Dr. Green, thank you. I'm feeling very confident here in my red dress. So, <laughs> I, I, oh my God. <laughs> very good. You know, I'd, I'd echo uh, Dean's point. I mean, I think um, one of the biggest changes that I'm seeing is, is this real impatience for education, innovation, and, and from, from folks in the mainstream, but also from folks that weren't involved in the education conversation, even as recent as five years ago. And so I think that that... 
Um, that is not just an education conversation, that's a private sector conversation, that's a policy conversation where I think that echo chamber was much smaller. We talked about this mm -hmm. five or six years ago, we remember kind of being the same hundred people who were interested in this topic or a thousand people across the country. And I think what we're seeing is this broadening of, of conversation around it. I think that's really important. Um, I think what comes with that, though, is, um, is a, a very noisy um, environment and a very noisy industry. Um, and I think that right now we're in this phase where we are going to seeing who's going to play what role. What role will policy actually play in actually opening mm -hmm. up the industry for innovation? What role will this very franchise, specifically in a K-12 model, um, you know, where will they embrace that innovation? Um, so I think that that's the biggest piece. I think the other thing that's happening is uh, because of all the players, whether they're content providers or now media companies or everybody who's in the education game, um, I think we're seeing a good turn where the student as the center, um, we're, ha we're, ha we're changing the conversation, where the student as the consumer um, of education is actually playing a bigger role than they ever have before. And I think that's good for the industry in general. All right, I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper, <coughs> toss up for anyone who wants to go there. I've understood that you've said the technological advances are, are here, that there's a growing demand from across the ecosystem. So the question I wanna understand is just go one layer deeper. What are the promising or emerging business models that are at least capturing your imagination or giving you a spark that says, this might break three. And anybody want to share a bit about what they're seeing specifically, not on the advances technologically. I think we've all you've all said that that's come, that's been there. What's the business model innovation that's got your interest or attention? Please. Let me let me uh, just jump on uh, Dr. Green's uh, comment about MOOCs, for example. And if you think about the business innovation, what's capturing uh, our attention out in, in this year, particularly, I, I think MOOCs and this discussion about credit and how they will actually offer access to students for courses they may not be able to get uh, is the debate in California, for example. And the governor and the pro tem of the Senate are all interested in MOOCs providing a way of access. Uh, they're not talking about a business model about MOOCs providing cost savings. What they're really saying is that if a student can't find a course and that that university isn't offering an online course, why wouldn't they be able to go to a third party provider and receive credit for a course that a university would approve. Now, the big question in the fortress built there is the credit, obviously. It's the universities making the big decision of whether or not, business-wise, they're going to be able to figure out the deal that makes sense for that credit. I think that's the debate, but I think the real debate, big term, in terms of where the MOOCs are going, and a lot of them are in Silicon Valley, uh, whether it's Sebastian Thruns or Daphne Kohler's or others, I think the real issue simply is where will the MOOCs go? I mean, will MOOCs be, continue to be interest-based, meaning free, available for those who get what they need and drop out rather quickly, thus the, the, the very low passage rates? Or will MOOC move into this new credit type of function where MOOCs see universities with needs they can't fulfill, then move in with some cost structures some business models that allow them to fulfill that and I think what the university should be really worried about is maybe a third category of MOOCs. So not an academic MOOC, not necessarily an interest-based MOOC, but I would call it a career path MOOC, where MOOCs really start to look at businesses and say, you know, that university really isn't giving you the employee that you need. And so what we're really going to do is try to work with you to find the faculty, to find the 12 courses, to offer it online for free in some cases. Of course, they're getting a pay to fee by the, by the corporation, but I think Ultimately, I think what the university should be threatened about is the fact that MOOCs themselves can move into a career path that many employers are very interested in. And I think all of these MOOCs have to make some decisions. Are they going to be professional career-based MOOCs? Are they going to be academic MOOCs? Are they going to be, in some senses, uh, continue to be the interest-based MOOC? Uh, I think that's what's really going to change the debate here. And if I could just leave you uh, on the last aspect of the MOOC, let me just give you a statistic. And going back to Ken's television uh, uh, example in the 70s, the census told us that one, in 1970, 1% of all cab drivers in the nation had a BA degree, had a, had a bachelor's degree. The recent census now tells us 
cab drivers have a bachelor's degree. I don't know what that tells anyone out there, but I think it There's tells... There's a lot more technology in the car, you see, <laughs> understand. Well, I think Uber's getting rid of that. So, you know, so, so, but, I, but, I do, but I think what's ultimately happening here is that we are seeing a broadening gap between the cost of education and what the value of the degree. And I think what you're going to find is that a lot of MOOCs are going to look at that gap and ask the question, should we go to employers directly, which I think directly affects the university's role. Because what does it mean then to have college uh, education and, and so, degree? So let's, let's, let's pull on sure. this string. You just ra raised an idea that, to be fair, the $2 billion Labor Department grants, yes. that's a lot of money, by the way. That's it not is. chump change. Uh, was to design, I guess using your language, the career path. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they would use the word MOOC. That probably isn't where they were directly going. But the premise being, uh, what are the skills in the economy? What, what's being taught? and what might be collectively built so that that particular need is filled in the most efficient way possible. Are we seeing early evidence that any of that uh, construct is working? Uh, anyone want to comment on whether that career path MOOC, as I guess you've described it, is happening, uh, Dean? Anyone else want to react to that? Well, I, I wanted to react to sure. Dean's comment, sure. and that was um, when he was speaking about that, I kind of had this vision of um, you know, MOOC meets LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Right, where you kind of, if you're going to go down that path of um, professional development and uh, how do you reach out to people who in that category, it's quite an interesting thing. One of the um, interesting dilemmas, though, is when we look at business models for how to do this, is that really we talk about free education, and, and Michael Saylor talked about this yesterday, and he's created a foundation to help facilitate that, but really nothing's really free. At the end of the day, somebody is funding and supporting all of this. And even with the MOOCs, I mean, they're able to offer them free now because they've, gotten a, they've raised a lot of money. But just like open educational resources that were funded and supported, what happens when that money runs out if you can't figure out a business model that makes that sustainable over time? And we see that with the open educational resources that were created a decade ago um, through the Hewlett uh, Foundation dollars, is where is the money you know, going to be to keep those up to date and to revise those as they need to be revised? So it's very interesting. I mean, when you look at... Um, uh, career paths and how all of this fits together is that I still go back to Michael Spence's uh, signaling theory, which I think he brought into play in 1969, uh, which is a long time ago, back to your comments earlier, that, uh, you know, credentials still matter. They signal to employers and all of that. University credentials still send a signal. And until we can break that chain, um, the notion of being able to do other kinds of education that per, um, that sends a signal of a different kind, whether it be professional development or badges or something like that, um, that have credibility with employers, I think we, we're still going to struggle. Now, uh, uh, before I get to you, Tammy, I'm going I'm to just one more thread of this, and then I'm going to switch to barriers. You made a presumption, and I want to make sure I pull it a little bit further. Cost. Uh, who's going to fund it? That presumes the, the cost is roughly the same. Uh, Richard, I'm not putting you on the spot, but Microsoft has transitioned to the cloud. So the cost of delivering email on premise versus delivering email as a service uh, uh, online, at least from my memory in the government, it was like 75% cheaper. So when Judith says, who's going to, quote, come up with the cost, if coming up with the cost is 75% cheaper because it's productized versus the traditional service model, does that make that conversation easier? And more specifically, who's building emerging business models, if any of you are looking at them, that speak to that? Yes, it still costs, but it costs dramatically less, whether it's open or it's commercialized. You want to react to well, that? Well, one of the challenges, so that's a very good point, but one of the challenges you have with trying to take a commercial business model for an email system, as you just described, is that there's commonality with that particular type of approach. Whereas if you try to bring in the many different factions that exist within any industry, especially education, being as broad as it is, there's a huge challenge. One, um, and it's kind of odd that we're having this conversation in the Washington, D.C. area. With all the intelligence agencies we have here, they still have very much a siloed mentality. Well, guess what? Education is the same way. You rarely have the departments that are trying to build learning management systems talking to the departments that built the student information systems and so on. And so you have all of these different technology systems that don't talk to each other directly. You have to build some middleware piece to actually connect all of them. And guess what? Students don't like that. If you look at most of the uh, solutions that are in place today that are directed at the student, whether it's K-12 or higher ed, they're not designed with the student in mind. 
They're designed with the institution in mind. That creates a lot of havoc. And whenever you have that type of chaos, you have extended expenses. And so trying to look at a business model where, you know, we've taken something that was on premises and moved it into the cloud, you say, hey, we're getting huge cost savings. When we did that, we were dealing with a finite set of resources that we knew. People wanted countering, people wanted X. That was very simple to do. And we controlled everything. When well, Richard, just to push back though, haven't we done that with the 40 plus states that have adopted Common Core? Uh, they've adopted Common Core, but how well have they yeah. implemented Common no, no, Core? No, no, I'm just but, asking. But no, the but that's, that's, the, that's the issue. The, so the, the theory is, I guess this is a question yeah. about what you all are seeing about the right. future. Sure. If there are standardized definitions of math, sure. would that make it easier to have the equivalent of that? I'm just asking what yeah. you're seeing. Tammy? Yeah. Look, let me talk a little bit about the model here and be provocative in terms of what I see is out there right now. And let me talk a little bit at the K 12 level. So um, I think there's, there's two matrices on this. The first is what you're seeing in K-12 is a lot of freemium, right? And what you also are seeing as a part of that freemium is what I would call a lot of engineering and not necessarily education. So what you're seeing is a threshold of where you're actually being able to engineer products at, you know, at a cheaper and cheaper dollar value to actually come up with a product. Um, and those are being put into the K-12 market, um, and we're all cheering for this because I think as a portfolio of, you know, we need some of those to become big organizations and big companies in order to get to your last point, which is the scale piece. Correct. But what happens when that, when that happens, when, when you have a freemium model and you have a lot of engineering going on and um, is that the dollars that it takes is to address the issue in K-12 that Dr. Green talked about, which is the infrastructure around it. Mm -hmm. The rhetoric around education technology is up here right now. So we've broadened the conversation to mainstream, but the implementation of it is a very different thing. The implementation of getting it into not the early adopters in those T-curve, but the middle of the curve where we can actually really innovate at scale is where we have to focus. And frankly, building that infrastructure takes dough. Um, you know, we're lucky, I see Matt uh, Greenfield from Rethink Education in here, who's one of our investors, and I think that you know, we are a education technology company, we're a SaaS-based company, but people ask all the time with our business model, you know, you guys have this entire infrastructure that you're having to build. You're, you know, you've got 20, you know, numerous people, over 50 people across 24 states, you know, are you the technology company? And what I answer all the time is if you were really going to have business models in the K-12 space that technology companies that survive, you have to be willing uh, to build that infrastructure to help them in that adoption. Not just the early adopters, not just the innovators, but to bring the rest along. And that takes time. Um, that takes great engineering and education projects, but it also takes an infrastructure that I think we're going to have to recognize that if we want to empower the ed tech industry to do that, to compete with the publishers, to compete with those other people, we're going to have to we're going to have to support some models, um, and and let them and let them win. And I think the policy. So to your point about Common Core, the policy level has to enable that to happen. We have to have efficacy around it. We've got to be able to demonstrate that we're not fly by night. Um, but we've got to allow some of those models to play out. And, um, and you know, I think that that's what's happening right now. Can so I, let me just, if I'm going to get to you. <coughs> what I'm going to do right now is uh, the first question chunk was around the changing landscape. And if I summarize what I've heard from you all, that there's been clearly a lot of technological innovation. There's been more mainstream and bottom-up demand and maybe 360-degree demand. Uh, but we haven't, we're still in the, I don't want to put a number on it, but say first inning, second inning on the business model test that we're betting into. So we're, we're seeing change technologically, but not necessarily fully yet on the business model opportunity, which then leads me to the second theme of questions we wanted to get into, which is the barriers. So, uh, Dean, if you wanted to pick up from that thread, yeah, right. given what Tammy just said, you know, if this is an area where you require a lot more infrastructure up front, someone's got to put a lot more, uh, you know, pennies on the table, if you will, to get started. 
the chicken and egg problem. Is, there, uh, is the market conducive to buy those once those investments in infrastructure are made? Or is this, give us a sense of the barriers that you're seeing. What, what's the system doing more generally, either holding us back or enabling? Give us a feedback on that. Sure. Uh, and let me connect your, your question about the, the Department of Labor's money. Because yeah. let's, let's, let's talk about that in, in the barrier category. You know, I, I think you, you, you said, are we in first base or second base? I think the problem inning. is- Inning, first or second inning of a nine well, inning. Well, I think- yes. I, I, all yeah. good. No, but Take I, your but, metaphor. No, 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 no. But, our line. Yeah, but I think the problem is we keep using the same pitcher. And, and by, that, I mean, by that, I mean, what we find is that we have good intentioned government money. For example, $2 billion to build open educational resources to be taught to students who need skill sets. And, Yet, you know, we look at the program and ask the question, how much educational resources are actually being created under that? It's a very vanguard wish. It's a very, it's a very high order to think we'd have $2 billion to create resources that uh, Alana and Saylor and others could grab and utilize over and over and professors and others. And I, th I think if you think about that for a moment, the barrier to that is the fact that we give money and Dr. Green hit it perfectly right on the head. We give money and people take those and put them back into their legacy systems. It, nothing changes. They, they grab money and they say, okay, I've got uh, $20 million, West Hills Community College in California, one of the grantees. I'm supposed to train students, but I'm going to put that back into our legacy structure, which means students who come to class, park, are sitting at seat time from hours between 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And supposedly, and, and I think it's going to work, but I'm just going to give you an example of wh where money meets legacy. This is our system. We'll offer more courses to these students, and everything will be fine. Well, the reality is at West Hills, less than 2% of those students are residential. They all travel to the campus. They all live somewhere between 50 to 60 miles away. It's a very rural institution. They're all over the age of 23. Many of them work. So the question would have been, would we have provided an online solution with these dollars in those same skill sets? Would that have been a different experience? Well, pause, Debbie Downer. Sure. Uh, are the, uh, <laughs> it, has anyone seen the opposite? Have there, you know, for every West Hills, is there an XYZ that's embraced this to build the new infrastructure? That was hopefully where I was going with this. Has anyone right. seen this? Give me yeah. anything. Come on, Tammy, get yeah. what you got. I mean, I think it's those places in between that we, you know, we hear of the, these examples in, um, in, in big districts, again, from a K-12 example um, that are doing it. But I actually see these middle-sized districts um, that are really innovating, you know, that, that frankly have gotten the short end of the stick for a long time. Um, and are now using technology. Are you in back in K-12 or are you at community college? I think in both. I mean, I think we operate in both K-12 and higher ed. And I think that the, it's almost the places that kind of have recognized that they're behind yeah. that have the opportunity to jump ahead. Um, we work with a, a variety of, um, of schools down in the Mississippi Delta. Um, and I think that we were able to pair demand-driven dollars to move down there. And what we're seeing is, in some ways, this ability to kind of ignore their legacy systems more because they're, frankly, um, ready to innovate in a way that, they, that, that they're being forced to because they're behind. So there are pockets of it, but I right, think right, it's, well, there well, are barriers. I hear you that there are pockets, but I want to get Judith, tell me, we have resources, we've got technological uh, advancements, we've got demand. A, B, and C are all active ingredients for success. Have we not put the systems together to do this? I mean, how, how is it conceivable that the application from West Hills, I don't know them from Adam, but assuming West Hills kind of messed this thing up. No, what, they, did a great, they did a great job. No, 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 no. no, no. Just, I, 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 I'm, I'm pushing back on you. They funded Legacy. I just want to understand. What, 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 Judith, what is the industry in this room or participating in the future architecture? Are they just sort of passively sitting by watching these funds flow? Or are they actively participating in collaboration with schools to put proposals forward to fund the future? What I want to understand, uh, Dean, and maybe Judith, you could comment this way, hmm. is, the, uh, is the language written from the grant to the point where they, it was forced down funding legacy? Or did we just, did the industry, in this case, the ed tech industry, fail to embrace this and paint the better picture to fund the future 
the, the productization you described. Just give me a flavor, Judith. Is this Debbie Downer sad, or is there a, whoa, no. this is a great opportunity. We're doing it. I, I, I think it, you know, it shouldn't be Debbie Downer sad. I mean, we're, we've never been in a better time in, in higher education or probably K-12 or a more exciting time to be involved in this industry or this sector um, to look at changes. But what we have to do is recognize that we're almost like throwing spaghetti at the wall and we're trying to see as we try new things and we, you know, we support these new innovations and we try them and we fund them that some of them are going to work and some of them are not going to work and we need to figure out you know, how you collect the information from those on what works and what doesn't work and how you use that, the learnings from that in terms of going forward. So I, I don't think it's, um, uh, I, I think everything that people are doing is well intentioned. I think that everyone is trying to make a change. I think that's a wonderful thing in this sector to see so many people engaged in thinking of doing things new ways and actually trying um, new approaches. And uh, uh, I, I don't think any of that can be seen as a negative um, uh, kind of investment. So we've identified a huge barrier being the challenge of legacy mm -hmm. uh, and a, perhaps a limitation of our measurement capacity to figure out what works for scale. Are there other barriers that we want to get on the table before we get to the question of scale? I general? think there is a barrier in that the way the funds are allocated. So if you look at K-12 as an example, the money that came from the Department of Education around longitudinal data grants as well as Race to the Top, it was focused more on accountability. So you're basically collecting data for the sake of doing analysis. I think if that same amount of money had actually been allocated and what you do is you set up a two-tier system. The first tier is about getting states to demonstrate something innovative. You pick winners there, you have them build it, and then you pick what is best, and now you build grants around that. So you're actually doing something that pushes back into the actual education and learning process more so than the accountability process. I, I think that's been one of the biggest barriers we're seeing around the money that is flowing into education right now from the federal government in that we're providing a lot of money to education and it's needed, but I think the money is not being allocated properly. It's the uh, consequences of bad intentions, basically. I mean, we're, we're going out there doing something that we think is right, but unfortunately, because we're putting so much attention on accountability, we're losing people. We're, we're losing students because we're really not teaching them necessarily the skills they need, getting back to an earlier point you raised. We're really trying to figure out where they are, and then also somewhat teaching to the test. I think if we're taking that same amount of money, I mean, we're talking in the area of 20 plus billion dollars overall that we've been spending here over the last seven years or so. If we would taken that money and been a little smarter about how we used it, I think we could have gotten much better results. Uh, Dean or Tammy, any reaction, final comments on barriers before we get to the question of scale? So let's, all right, well, let's just, uh, let me, let me summarize this piece to say uh, lots of resources, lots of good intentions, lots of opportunity, but the uh, systems themselves are not yet embracing what's necessary to demonstrate the change or at least even to test a number of hypotheses. If that may be a bit too negative, I, I'm, a, I'm a more of an optimistic guy. I think there's a lot more there, but let's just pause there. So what is it going to take? to identify if we did this all over again, and the good news is there's still resources not yet deployed, and I'm just thinking about federal resources, there's still nonprofit and others, but the question is, what is it that we are doing? What is happening right now that gives us a sense that we're creating the mechanisms for testing new ideas, measuring what works, and scaling? Give us any sense for a storyline or a thread as to what's giving you hope. Hey, here's a pocket, it's being well-researched, it's what's going on, and based on the evidence, we think there's a path to scale. Anybody want to give it, tell us a story as to how this does scale, given what we've just talked about? Well, I'll take the first shot at it. I think social media being introduced both in K-12 and higher ed as a learning tool, I think is showing a lot of promise. Because what we're doing there, we're seeing that students are actually helping one another learn. And you learn better from your peer group. I mean, we know that as kids. You learn better from your siblings than you do from your own parents. And we're seeing that in the education process as well. And then also providing the teacher or professor insight as to what is going on in the classroom through those social media uh, tools is a fantastic job. I mean, I, I worked with some folks down at the University of Central Florida where what they noticed was they were losing a lot of the connectivity between the professor and the students because a lot of the students were using social media tools that the school didn't have access to 
to actually collaborate with one another. So we worked with them on a project where we moved a lot of that interconnectivity into the cloud that touched all of the different social media tools the students were using. And now the professor could actually get in. So basically, we were creating uh, virtualized classrooms within a particular segment of the um, Calculus One section. And now professors could actually monitor what was going on between the different clusters in the classroom, provide input, and the students themselves were actually working with one another. It became much more of a collegial environment, and the students got a lot of value out of it. So there's an example of where technology actually uh, was not a barrier, it was actually uh, an inducement for the students to collaborate with one another, given their busy schedules, given the dispersed way that a lot of our college students are actually interfacing with one another in that no longer are we in a traditional classroom methodology where everyone is sitting in the room at the same time. People have different work schedules, uh, people have all sorts of other activities outside of the classroom. So that is one example of where technology is actually playing a very positive role in the situation. And it's not costing the school a lot of money. But I, I'm pushing on this question of scale because that feels like in the first tranche of questions an example of an innovative way of collaboration. <laughs> but sounds like it's cute, but I'm not so sure it scales. I want to get a flavor yeah. for what are the mechanisms for scale? Does policy have to play a role? What are you seeing out there as we project out over the next several years? Do you want to go I first? I think one of the really exciting areas now in higher education is outcomes-based or um, competency-based education. Thank you. All right. First time and we're talking about the financial yeah. model. Go ahead. So competency-based education and the, you know, the um, support now that is uh, available, especially through the Dear Colleague letter that came out recently, um, for institutions to actually embrace competency-based education. And I think that that will have a very interesting effect on higher ed. We're seeing um, in our organization a lot of institutions that are interested in going to competency-based education, but they don't really know how to get there. And we've built a, um, what I call the next generation learning <laughs> management system. I call it a virtual learning environment because it's really a different paradigm um, of, a, of a virtual learning environment that, will act, that actually embraces competency-based education and helps do adaptive and uh, personalized education. And so uh, I think that the combination of the technology to enable that and the policy to support competency-based education will help us create um, models for higher education that can scale. That's what I was hoping for. Uh, any reaction to you, Dean and Tammy, on that conversation? Let me just add one thing. I mean, I think there are two elements that are helping in terms of being able to do a lot of efficacy work around education technology. The first is time. And the second is the ability to have institutions, whether higher ed institutions or K-12 districts, um, actually devise implementation of this at scale. Because I think one of the things that we're finding in terms of doing efficacy in our higher ed learning platforms and K-12 and, and doing that type of control studies and things like that is that we've had to get the implementation right first. And it's had to have been big enough um, that we can go back in a year three, in a year four, in a year 10, and actually do that type of competency and assessment. And so I think that's an attitude change, right? Which is that people are willing to dabble in doing small pilots and small, um, you know, in a portfolio effect, oh, I'll do a couple of pilots around all of this with just a few, a few students. And in order to really prove that this is working at scale, you have to have some folks that are willing to take a risk. I can give you an ex two very brief examples. So in Houston ISD, which is a big public district um, down in Houston, Texas, that we've been working with our financial literacy learning platform, um, we, are f you know, we are finally at that scale with them where we have enough students going through that we can actually look at you know, providing different type of assessment models and really get some data back. Um, and I think that that has been a testament to their willingness to actually implement at scale. And I think that's going to play a huge role on the policy side, too, to take those labor dollars or those DOE dollars and say, how do we, how do, we do this at scale and not just pilot around the country? Dean, and <coughs> when I get to you, um, we're going to have about five minutes or maybe 10 max on questions from all of you. So maybe you want to make a sure, comment thank, and we can turn it over for Sure, yeah. I, I think the... Uh, I'm sitting here pondering what scale means. Uh, and so there's system scale, which mm -hmm. let's say University of California system, there's statewide scale, and then there's national scale. So I think from my, my, my view of this, I'll use a, a small case study. So uh, we had some foundations, Hewlett ourselves, 
uh, Gates Foundation, fund 50 open source, or five open source textbooks. We built those, three are out, two are coming. I think Donnie's talking about this a little later uh, from, uh, from Rice University. But, but the point is we, we had uh, three open source textbooks. We, we went to Governor uh, Brown, and, and the governor saw the merits in this, signed a bill that said California should create 50 open source textbooks for its undergraduates, because we knew 80% of those students are taking 25 to 50 lower division courses. We know the outcomes of those particular courses, what stats is stats, you have some outcomes. So they're well underway. After that, British Columbia Pause decided- for a second. Sure. Who's funding that? Because well, if you get to the question of legacy versus yeah, future me, infrastructure, that's so a high-end cost of- In this is a very interesting way California did this. So now California says we will put $5 million in to be matched <laughs> by philanthropy and foundations and others to match the additional $5 million. The, the goal there is to build in 25 to 50 open source textbooks with a matched type of system. So everybody's in, if you will. But I think what's interesting about scale is, and then you found British Columbia deciding to do this. You found other states now introducing bills this year. Like what legislator doesn't want to introduce a bill to lower the cost of textbooks for undergraduates? So you find now states beginning to talk about, let's all build 25 to 50 books. The bigger question from a federal government perspective, I think, is really why should every state build the same books. You know, why wouldn't we have some, uh, if you will, some guidance from uh, our federal government to say, look, you know, everyone shouldn't build 50 books. If every state built 10 or five, you know, maybe this is a way to build the, the true repository. And just, just pause before you finish sure, that statement sure. to clarify. We're in Virginia. Yes. Virginia has as its law right. that uh, guidance to the schools that if there's funding from the government, the resources are Creative Commons licensed. Right. Uh, in the $2 billion labor grants, yeah. similarly, a right. requirement for Creative Commons licensure. So just want to be clear, that yeah. would not mean you'd start from scratch in each book. You'd basically remix and reuse. Right, is that exactly. Right? right, exactly. Okay. I mean, I think so that is policy, but I want to make sure I want to make that But the that point right. is, how do we scale that in a way that everybody is talking to each other and sharing? And I'll give you an example. I think if, if the federal government were to put out a, you know, uh, let's just use a number, a $500 million allocation to get this coordination going to allow states to not necessarily look to philanthropy and others, but to be matched to build these books. It seems, and to have these con constant updates uh, and make them better, it seems that that's the kind of scale that really is, would be far-reaching, uh, would have positive impacts. It builds on technology because obviously you mentioned CK12 and Flexbooks and others. I mean, these are the kinds of things I think that offer tremendous amounts of potential for scale, but the hard part is coordinating. I think uh, everyone got together in Canada just a week ago and talked about how everybody could, could coordinate, but I think the hard part for us is in this particular movement is how do we have that type of coordination and guidance? I think that would be a real positive. Good question. Anyone from the audience want to bring forward a question for our panel before we wrap to get you back to uh, campus, if you will? Please stand up and tell us your name. Hi, Jason. It might be partly based on the way you started. It might be partly based on the way you started the conversation, Anish, kind of like what's the government's role. Yes. And, but the question I have for you guys is it, it has ended up being a very much how can government drive open resources, how can government drive uh, innovation, when in fact, you know, taking the MOOCs and maybe their hype, but that, there was no government grant involved in creating the MOOCs and all of that. There was sure. no government grant created in starting Blackboard, which became a billion dollar company and doesn't necessarily have the best learning management system in the world, but you know, was a very successful company. Lots of the innovations uh, in every other industry have come out of private sector, venture backed or even just bootstrap backed companies. How important uh, should the government role be here or should the government back off uh, in some way and, and let the innovators do it themselves? It's a phenomenal question. Would love to get any reaction, but just to clarify and make sure we want, we're on the same wavelength, the question about government role was on the question of scale and whether policy is today an inhibitor or a barrier or an enabler. Just to clarify, a lot of the experimentation and testing you're describing is all clearly funded from the private sector. Please. I mean, my perspective is whether the question is about scale or not, I think the policy environment has the ability to open up. And we started this conversation about what has changed in the market, and the answer from all of us was the number of people at the table, right? Uh, and that we wanted this to be demand-driven. 
Um, and if this is going to be demand-driven education that fills the pipeline of jobs, my sense is that we have to look at the education industry with the private sector playing a huge role in it. Um, and that the policy opportunity is that collaboration, is understanding what's working, is allowing it. So to your, to your business model question, and my answer that those can scale mm. to actually serve more students. And the, the barrier, at least in K-12, to scaling is this very franchise model of K-12, where a business has to go out to 15,000 school districts to find you know, scale to students. And so you know, I think about you writing five textbooks, and I say, where, do we, where does the market come in? And where does the demand-driven market come in that says, um, it is not just, there's lots of content providers now, and how do we get the best in our districts? How do we get the best in the university? So I think the private sector has a huge role to play in this. Yeah. Uh, Dean, uh, Judith yeah. first, then Dean. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, I, I think, um, you know, it's not mutually exclusive. I mean, I think there's a, a role for both. <coughs> As we know, a lot of the innovations have, some innovations have come out of our institutions, either public or private, and some of them have come through venture-backed, and some of them are government-supported. But I think at the end of the day, in higher education, if you're in a regionally accredited institution, I mean, one of the, we go back to barriers, I mean, one of the barriers to getting some of this stuff out there is, um, you know, the accrediting system and the process and being able to get innovative ideas through your accreditors. So, um, you know, I, I think there is a role there to remove, you know, government can play a role, whether it's, uh, you know, working probably at a federal level, working with accreditors across the board, especially the regional accreditors in terms of how to become more receptive to the innovative models that are there. I mean, we have a, a grant from the uh, Next Generation Learning Challenge um, through uh, Educause and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation working on some innovative things, and they have some other grantees who have come up with these great um, ideas and innovations that have been supported that they can't really launch because the accreditor won't let them. So I think there's where a role for the government to help. That was the question. But keep going on this thread. Is there a pure uh, libertarian view of the world that suggests we could completely disrupt this market without any role? <laughs> I'd love to get that. Just please engage. Dean. Yeah, well, uh, I think that that's a very interesting way to put that. <laughs> but uh, if you look, let's, let's start with some real case studies here. If anyone here in this room thinks that MOOCs don't want access to the credit, um, raise your hand. I mean, they're all private anyone? sector. They're all, they're, they're all private sector driven at the beginning, but they will all run to government to be protected within some fortress. And whether it's MOOCs, yeah. whether it's the publishing industry with textbooks, Let's just face it, uh, the reason that the open textbook movement is flourishing today is textbooks have increased three times inflation. Uh, students are being held to a standard that professors pick for them. Professors pick books, students have to buy it. It's kind of like the doctor and the prescription. And government will find itself stepping into market failures, if you will. Uh, in this case, I think uh, to scale up on open source textbooks, uh, governments have a, a rightful role to build competition where there is none to, uh, in many cases, kind of a monopoly of uh, just a few publishers. Mm -hmm. In the case of MOOCs, I think what you'll find is that MOOCs will very much be interested in trying to figure out how to be an outlet for students when they cannot move through to a path to completion. They will offer lower cost courses, if you will, to those students answering the question of course affordability. You're going to find that when institutions themselves fail, not just markets, they'll find the private sector moving in, but at some point those protections will be sought for, uh, sought by those particular uh, entities. So I think there's a, there's a dual interest in each. Uh, government is never innovative enough sometimes. And let, when, and sometimes. when you were with Obama, sometimes. they were. But, 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 but I think uh, what happens is this interplay of let us flourish, then support us, then protect us. Mm is always going to be a cycle that I think all of us should be aware of. And I think there is always going to be that dynamic. Other questions before we wrap up? I can maybe see one in the back. Yes, sir. Tell us your name. Hi, Anisha. My name is Paul McGowan with the Center for Oh, what's up, Paul? How are you? Uh, in Virginia. My, my question was sort of close to Jason's question. But I wonder if we have a speed problem. If you look at the speed of innovation, the speed of technology, it's very, very fast. If you look at the speed of policy making, <laughs> the speed of accreditation, the speed of proving if something really works in the classroom, that's very slow. So do the technologists and innovators slow down, or do the rest of the 
stakeholders get faster. Yeah. Can I just jump? You may. I, I think that's a really, uh, was the answer by our first, our, our opening speaker. The dynamic in what you've just mentioned is risk. So if you are a policymaker, if you're a politician, if you are someone who's going to be making a governor, uh, you want to minimize as much risk as possible in that speed of innovation. Speed is not your friend unless it can be proven in many cases by mitigating risk. Now, risk also, uh, in many cases, to some policymakers could be a good thing, to be the first out, to capitalize an idea whose future might come. You know, there are policymakers like Senator Steinberg in California that might challenge and say, maybe our institutions should let third party providers provide an outlet and give the credit. Big, bold moves sometimes do occur on the government political side. Uh, CC by licenses in Virginia. I mean, these were early, early types of actions placing a big bet on where I think this space may go. On the innovator side, there may be some frustration because I think they want to, in, in essence, get ingrained into, a, if you will, a policy making protection. But they're also wary. I, I, I've, I always watched when I was a past uh, Senate Majority Leader in California. Uh, Innovators come to talk to me about this great idea and then get really worried as I started to tell them, I think I want to do a bill on this. And they would go, oh my gosh, you know, we, we came here for, a, for an aspirin, not brain surgery. We just want to tell you what we're interested in. But policymakers are interested in capturing ideas and trying to formulate them. So those very fast advances sometimes could be, in, in essence, killers in some cases. So I think slowing down, uh, if, even in the innovation side and proving those pilots has been mentioned. Uh, is extremely important. So it's kind of a, a between both. Anyone want to respond to this last question and then we can wrap up so we can get back to the piece? Uh, Judith, uh, Richard, Tammy, any, any final questions on, on response to this pace of change, this question of where the, where's the role of the private sector to drive? Where, where's policy? Any final remarks? I this? think the only thing I would say is that, um, you know, I, I don't have an answer to should I, you know, technology slow down or policy mm -hmm. speed up because I, I don't know if either is possible. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that if you frame it in the context of when you're trying to make decisions in this area uh, in education, whether it's K-12 to or higher ed, if you frame it in the context of what's in the best interest of our learners, it might actually um, help us either slow down a little or speed up a little. Um, I think what will be re really interesting to the future for me is if we can come up, and, and the MOOCs may be the model, it may be something else, but if you can deliver a $50 MOOC um, to a student that actually can get academic credit and then a credential for that, I mean, that would be a major breakthrough. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take the chair's prerogative to just summarize what I think may be a way to digest uh, a number of these questions and the reactions just on the fly, if I may. So let me, let me see if I can wrap in the following manner. First, I want to just dispel the notion that it's an either-or proposition. Uh, what we're hearing today about the challenges and the barriers and the need for some type of collaboration, public and private, uh, it's not engineered as a one-size-fits-all. The beauty of today and the moment we're in is that there's a lot of experimentation, whether it be West Hills for good or ill uh, or others. There are institutions that are engaged in trying new ideas, and they're going to demonstrate, I hope, some efficacy that we'll see will hopefully lead to some scale. But let me just describe for you what's happening right now as a way to uh, close this piece out. We started the conversation about workforce. I think your thread, Dean, of the career path MOOC business model innovation may be the one just to use as the closing. The tech industry has said emphatically, we have high demand for software testing. We heard this, I heard this at the White House a lot. We launched an initiative last summer, Summer Camp, uh, spelled Q-A-M-P for quality assurance, to get kids, uh, basically underprivileged kids, internships and exposure uh, where they could potentially see a career path that has a high earning potential. So in the spirit of understanding the credentials that are needed to be a quality assurance technician, we saw that the Association for Software Testing had open sourced its assessment framework and its credentialing documents. We saw last summer and going into this year the production of an open source textbook, again at CK12, that allows uh, folks to access that information. Not yet, but possible, is the publication or the development of an online course or a hybrid course that could provide that uh, textbook life and to educate kids to see what's possible for them to enter the software testing arena. Given what Judith said, one could uh, uh, design that course with competency-based models at heart 
so that the actual price of that course could be reimbursed through financial aid, which is what you were describing earlier with the dear colleague letter. And we could have, theoretically, a model for scale because the software industry, Association for Software Testing, has said folks that have earned these credentials, if they're badged, I think uh, you, Richard, someone mentioned the badges movement, could conceivably award industry credentials associated with a paid-for competency-based model course built on open education resources in an area where there is high demand and a high lucrative job as one little microcosm to test. And it seems to me from the conversation we're having, there's a bit of everybody in there. The entrepreneur who's building the for-profit uh, course material built off of some open education resources with their secret sauce. Maybe the big data analytics folks saying what works for kids and what doesn't. Maybe it's got some federal funds because it's part of a labor grant. Either and all of these scenarios are possible right now without a change in law and without any real significant change in budget. That's the possibility. So I think if we've tried to stitch these pieces together, my conclusion from all of this is we're actually in a good place. Technological advances are strong. There's a desire for reimbursement models and business models so that these things can scale. Um, and with Dear Colleague Letter and the competency base, there's at least a possibility. So I leave this conversation hopeful. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Thank you so much, and let's move on to the next thing. Uh, who's going to take us to the next thing? You will. All right. Thank you, panel.